you know, it's just a show, you know, the, the kids who are watching professional rugby players on TV, you know, it's not just a straight road from nine, ten years old straight to international rugby. There's a lot of bumps in that road and a lot of hurdles to get over, whether it's, you know, asthma, wearing glasses, coaches, teachers, whatever it is. You know, there's a, there's a lot of hurdles, but you can get there, you know, there's, there's no straight road there. Sorry, Pally, yeah, all good, best. What's, uh, what's the news there? Anything going on? Same old, mate. Same old. So just just tell me what's happening there now because it's changing every day. Yeah, well, like I say, so Swansea's gone into lockdown uh, as of six o'clock tonight, Sunday. So it's the local lockdowns have started sort of back in Wales. So yeah, no, so we can only sort of travel outside of, of the region, um, you know, if it's for work or for, for emergencies, I suppose. So uh, yeah, I think it's... It's the same everywhere now, and uh, yeah, it's frustrating because we'd all, you know, in terms of community rugby, my boys playing playing rugby on a Sunday. It was their last session again today. They were just getting back into it, and uh, yeah, it's a shame because you know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's all up in the air a little bit. Next, we can go to school together, but then can't go outside and, and play touch rugby. So a little bit frustrating, but yeah, it's the same for everyone, Jim. Isn't it? You know, what's the lay of the land now? I don't know if you've seen the stuff around the prem. There's been some headline stuff like Tony Rose come out and said that you know if there's not fans back soon then potentially not potentially teams are going to go under Gloucester are struggling yeah. there's talk of Wasps Leicester some big clubs Newcastle I was at Saracens mate there so, I mean everyone is is just hemorrhaging money yeah what's the lay of the land mate in in Wales yeah I, th- I think rugby in general was not struggling but you rely on our revenue from from the crowds and you know it's, it's massive and w- without that I think it's, it's a huge disappointment and like you say when when we're in normal sort of terms the Ospreys, you know, in particular, rely on that revenue coming in, you know, through, through the gates. And without that, you know, I know it's, it's talk about loans and things, but there's only so long that can go on. And, um, yeah, it's really frustrating. So, the, the Pro 14 obviously kicks off again now next weekend um, without any crowd. So, obviously, they're hoping to get some sort of fans in um, at the start of October. But, again, that's not going to happen. So, yeah, financially, you know, it's not just the Welsh region's gym. Like you say, it's, it's all over. So, it's going to have an impact. Um and yes, yeah, it's sad to see, to be honest. And you've just retired amongst all this. I mean, what, how was that? I mean, the career that you've had, and we've had chats, um, you know, away from this, but my unbelievable career, surely you would have loved to have gone out, um, you know, with the kids, with a crowd, with your family there, all that stuff that you kind of picture, right? Yeah, in an ideal world, yeah, I would have loved that. Um, but... Yeah, so it's not just me. You know, obviously, John Barkley, as you know well, Jim, you know, he's finished and had the same sort of um, ending. Rob Carney, you know, just, just recently finished. Obviously, he's finished, you know, winning the league title, which, which is great. But, you know, no fans, you know, the career he's had, he would have had, you know, a huge send-off. So, yeah, I think it's, it's not ideal and would have loved, you know, to go out and tip the hat to the crowd, uh, you know, one last time. But, yeah, I also had a testimonial, which was supposed to, Go ahead in July, which obviously didn't. Uh, so hopefully that would be next summer. But you know the way it's going, you just never know, mate. When you look back on your career, and I'm sure there were many highlights, right? And I don't know whether you've had time to reflect during this time, or you, you know you might do in the future. For you, when you're looking back, what what are some of your fondest ones? Oh, I, I think a lot of my success was early on in my career, and so winning sort of uh, two league titles with the Ospreys in the space of a couple of years. Uh, 2008 Grand Slam was my first Grand Slam. So, so two years into p- playing professional rugby, you know, winning a Grand Slam, just playing in the Six Nations, sort of two years into professional rugby is, is, you know, is great. So to win something is obviously what we all want. So that, that was a great, um, great moment, winning that Grand Slam 2008, sort of beating England in Twickenham, first time in 20 years on the way to that Grand Slam. Um, and, and going on a Lions tour as well in 2009, was was great as well, a great experience. So, like I say, a lot of my success in, in the game came pretty early on. Um, and obviously, touring the Barbas with you, Jim, is right up there as well, mate. <laughs> hey, mate, that was, the, that was the best two weeks of my life. <laughs> <laughs> we'll forget about the result, though. That don't matter, is it? I, I couldn't even tell you what the result... I know we got beat <laughs> twice comfortably, but, uh, mate, yeah, I didn't think about the result. But 
That brings me on, okay, well, a couple of things that we've just spoken about there. A lot of people now have got time on their hands, especially in Wales. So what can they go and do? They can go and read. But also, uh, we're going to talk about your book here. There you go. Um, have you read it, Jim? Man, I, I'm near the end. I've read it to my son yeah. out loud. Yeah, mate, I have. And we'll, we'll get into it. And I, can, and I can ask you a few questions like I'm a book uh, critiquer or whatever <laughs> they call it. But um, I didn't know what to expect because I didn't know whether it was going to be like an autobiography or... Yeah. Um, or what? But let, let's talk a little bit about the book. Firstly, what you know, you know why? Why have why has James Hook brought out a children's novel book? I mean, it's not it's not for young kids, is it? I mean, I, I'm reading it. It's adults can read it as well. Yeah, it's just it's for middle age, uh, middle grade sort of kids. So end of primary, right through well to, to sort of eight year olds, if you like. You know, because parents can read it with their kids. It's uh, you know, it's a book for for all ages, sort of family book, but. Yeah, why did I decide this? It started when I was in Gloucester. Um, my eldest boy, Harrison, he wanted a rugby book uh, in a book fair after school. So I just thought it'd be, you know, the run of the mill, go into the book fair, grab, grab a, a children's book and I'll be that. But there wasn't, there wasn't one there. So he, he said, you know, we'll have a look online. Looked online and there literally wasn't any, any books for, for children. There was a lot of football books, like the, the uh, Frank Lampard books and things like that. But in terms of rugby, there was, there was nothing. So... That just got me thinking a little bit, and I didn't do anything about it for a year, year and a half. It was when I came back to Swansea. It was still nagging in the back of my head a little bit, so that's that's when I did do something and got in touch with a family friend, Mal Pope, who put me in touch with with a children's author, uh, Dave Brealey, who I'm co-authoring co-authoring the book with. Uh, I told him about my ideas, and literally as soon as I met him, you know, we we were meeting up two, three, four times a week. Uh, for a good few hours, just writing ideas down. Obviously, I, I had a lot of time to think about it, so I had a lot of ideas and how I wanted the book to go. And yeah, luckily we we got a once the first book was written, we had a publisher on board because that, that was probably the most difficult thing. Was it was almost the easy thing was writing a book. It was getting someone then to back it um, who believes in it, and that was Pete Burns, uh, Polaris Publishing, who, who absolutely loved it. We met up with him in Cardiff and signed a contract for a, for a two book. Deal, which uh, which you know was, was great for us, like you know. Yeah, amazing. And just tell me who Jimmy Joseph is because he's called JJ in the book. And like I said when we spoke before, my son's called Jack James, aka JJ. So I've I've kind of convinced him that the book's about him. <laughs> um, so let's start off. Like the book is around this young lad called Jimmy Joseph. Um, is it you? Is there a part of it of that person is you when you were growing up from some of your experiences? A hundred percent, yeah, and uh, it's a fictional book, so there are you know fictional parts to it that to Jimmy and the rest of the book, but yeah, a lot, a lot of it is based on me, and um, that that's what I wanted. So, for example, you know, I I wore glasses from the age of sort of nine, ten years old, so really short sighted, uh, asthmatic, um, you know, gangly, skinny kid, and all all of that is is Jimmy Joseph, and you know, I have a strong relationship with my grandparents who were still with us right through my my rugby career and, and off the field. So they feature heavily in the book and, you know, my, my parents who, who were divorced early on in my, in my life. So all that is, is reflected through, through Jimmy. So like I say, along with a lot of fictional parts as well. Mate, I, genuinely, I, it's really good. And I'll tell you why, maybe this is me overthinking it, right? Yeah. So I'm reading little bits and, you know, I, I had a, I'd say a different background and a different upbringing to, you know, your average Joe. But when I'm reading it, I'm picking up, and when I'm reading out loud to my son, who's nine, I'm picking up little life lessons, right, around the narrative. So one of them was it was being too small, and yeah. there's obviously the reference to Shane Shane Williams. I don't want to give too much of it away. There's references to bullying. Then you know the the other end of that is fulfilling your dreams, friendships, family, and all the dynamics around these things. I mean, was that a conscious thing? And I sound like a book critique. I'm not because I don't know whether I'm overthinking it, but. All these different things are what most kids have to deal with when they're growing up. And was that a conscious decision to go through? Yeah, definitely. And yeah, you you know, Jim, like growing up, you know, you come up across again, uh, across you know a lot of hurdles and you know some things. You know, might might sound minor, but you know the, the glasses thing. You know, there's, there's kids who come up to me now who've, who wear glasses and they're like, you know, oh, how can my kid, you know, play rugby? You know, he's really short sighted. And I was like, you know what. I was short sighted. I wore contacts then when I was sort of 14, 15 years old. And, you know, that, there are ways around, you know, a lot, a lot of different things. And that's only one small example. But, you know, it's just to show, you know, the, the kids who are watching professional rugby players on TV, 
you know, it's not just a straight road from nine, ten years old straight to international rugby. There's a lot of bumps in that road and a lot of hurdles to get over, whether it's, you know, asthma, wearing glasses, coaches, teachers, whatever it is. You know, there's a, a lot of hurdles, but you can get there, you know, there's, there's no straight road there. And you mentioned the coaches and the, and the teachers um, and the parents, I suppose, because, you know, people that are going to read this book um, will be interested in sport, will be interested in rugby. They might not. It might just be they just want to read the book to their kids. But I found the a, a really, it's quite sad the, 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 around the relationship with one of the teachers, but then Jimmy finding a father figure in yeah. Peter Clement. Is that the, the correct that's name? It, yeah. And, and obviously that, that's part of, you know, playing rugby playing sport, but also growing up is having a father figure, having someone to look up to that might not necessarily be your dad. Yeah, exactly. And I, and you, you're the same, all rugby players, professional rugby players, they've come you know, up against all sorts of coaches, teachers, and some would say, you know, they're the best things since sliced bread and, and some just, just on radio. And I suppose that's coaching in general, you know, I suppose selection is, is, is a coach's opinion at the end of the day. And I think, you know, the teacher, you know, referring to the book, Mr. Kane, who takes a dislike to, to Jimmy, he doesn't like the way he plays. Um, but then Peter Clement, who's sort of a, a local legend, who, who's played, you know, club rugby at, at the highest level um, and respected in, in the in the town, he sees Jimmy as a sort of rough diamond, if you like, and takes him under his wing and and helps him along. And every every kid, you know, boy or girl growing up need, needs that throughout their life. And I don't want to give too much more away, but you name drop some superstars of the game. And as I say, I'm probably three quarters of the way through now. And uh, I haven't, haven't seen Big Jim mentioned yet, but I'm thinking that's <laughs> going to be in the, uh, the epilogue, as they say. Is that what it's called at the end? I don't even know that's what it, it, yeah, it's called. It is. Look at me, I sound like a reader. Um, but how fun was that, you know, being able to name drop some of the lads that you played with as well? And use yeah, them? it is. And, and you know, we played some great players over the years. And um, it's just, I don't know, like, so obviously J- Jimmy's uh, friends are, are Manu, Matt uh, and Kitty. Uh, Kitty is, is the fastest girl in, in the school and on the rugby team and you know my co-author Dave, Dave Brady his his daughter was um was the girl in all boys football team in primary school so you know that, that happens you know all, all over the place so we were keen to get that in but obviously Manu doesn't take a, a rocket science scientist to to work out who that's about and uh yeah it was, it was nice to actually you know pick a few few players I played against and, and with over the years and, and put them in a book as well. And has your family read it have you, have you gone through it with the with all the kids, the wife and, and the wider family and how's it been received if they have? I mean, I mean, cause it's really good. I'm not just saying that. Like, I mean, I don't read many books, uh, <laughs> but reading it to the kids with the underlying narratives around it of just growing up, it's brilliant. And how's that been received with the family? Yeah, no, they, they did. They loved it. Well, they, they told me they loved it to my face. And they saw, what is she having on my back? It's another story, isn't it? <laughs> uh, no, my, my boys, I read it some, uh, you know, trapped in a night when, uh, when they fancy it and, Oh, they, they really like, especially my eldest boy. Um, you know, I, my grandparents, like I say, uh, they, they've, you know, partially blind. So I, I've read a few chapters, them gone up the house and, and they love it and my parents and everything. So, yeah, no, it's good. It's good. So it's well received. And uh, I hope next week, you know, when, once it actually goes on sale in, in shops and uh, other people read it, hopefully they think the same. And um, what about the, the Welsh lads, former teammates? Because there ain't many, there ain't many pictures um, so you know, genuinely, how's that going to go down with them? Yeah, Shane actually mentioned that the other day when uh, when I sent him a copy, and uh, it's actually yeah, I think once a few of the boys have, have received the book, you know, they've been quite surprised. I think they thought it'd be uh, you know a coloring book or something like that. But uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of words for the boys to uh, get their heads around. So hopefully they'll finish it at some point. Mate, and so when's the official release, and how can people get the book and and all that? Is it? I mean, some some lads are doing audio books and all that stuff I don't imagine that you, you've gone that deep into it you don't need to but where can everyone get the, the book if they want to yeah we haven't gone that far yet as far as audio books concerned but yeah Thursday 1st of October so next Thursday uh, it's officially released and you can pre-order it on Amazon now and like I say 1st of October it'll be out in, in sort of all the bookstores uh, Waterstones uh, local bookshops and like I say on the internet if you want to get it before that so yeah and for the millions of people watching it is called James Hook Chasing a Rugby Dream, and it's book one, kickoff. There it is. <laughs> Cannot wait to see my name in the end. Cannot wait. <laughs> uh, Hooky, I've taken a bit of shit, mate. I don't know if you've seen it recently. Um, I picked a Lions 15, which featured 
one Welshman who's arguably English in Nick Tonkins. And I did it without thinking. I don't know why. I don't know why I did it. Um, I know why I did it. Because it was my general thought process at that time off the back of the Six Nations. And um, I've lost a lot of Welsh friends <laughs> off the back of it. Tell me, um, a lad who's obviously played with a lot of good players, obviously toured as well, the British and Irish Lions. Um, some Welsh names that you would be certain that would be maybe on tour, but in that starting 15. Now, I'm being serious when I say it, because mm. I think, you know, Jonathan Davis, is, if, if he's fit, I think definitely there's talk of Alan Wynne-Jones. I can see him going. I mean, the yeah. lockdown's probably been good for him, you know, in yeah. terms of having that time. And I can see him definitely going maybe as a midweek captain. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think our lockdown for Alan Wynne has been, uh, been a godsend, hasn't it? And, uh, yeah, I think he'll definitely go on that Lions tour, you know, providing he's fit and... You know, someone like Ali, he could push his way into the test team, but, you know, it was obviously a Toji and, and Ryan who, who were right up there for the starting spot. And I think, like you say, Jonathan Davis, he's, he's one of Gatland's favourites. So he played his first game uh, on the weekend against the Ospreys back and he had, he had a full, I think it was 40 minutes and he came through all right. So I, I think he doesn't need a lot of games. If he can just show that he's, you know, right up there with what he was like uh, before he got injured, He'd probably be starting in the centre with with probably Tuolangi, um, and the other Welsh boys. I suppose the boat does. You know, is probably uh, Louis Rissamet. He hasn't had a cap yet, but you know, he's one who could potentially push his way through. I know you looked at Stuart Hogg at fifteen, but you've also still got Liam Williams, Lee Halfpenny, who's who's playing some really good rugby. Who's been criticised over the last sort of couple of years for his attacking ability, but he, he sort of developed that a little bit, and he's. Probably still one of the best defensive 15s in the world. You know, we saw that tackle, weekend. mate. I don't think I've seen the better tackle, mate. Yeah, yeah. You, you. I don't think any other 15 in, in the world could have could have made a tackle like that. I think it, other boat does maybe uh, Van der Merwe. I think because um, he, he can be capped now, can he? By, yeah. By Scotland. So his stats uh, towards the end of the, the Pro 14 last season were, were ridiculous. So and he, he's Gatland's type of winger, and he's he's, he's big, strong, powerful. Can beat blokes and particularly out in South Africa, you know you want you want boys like that who are big and physical and and can make make yards. So yeah, who knows? You know, it's just six, seven months, eight months down the line. So a lot can change, Jimbo. Mate, you've not gone for many Welsh lads either. And this is the thing: I'm not looking to open you up. I think you know there's been a change of guard in Wales, like naturally. You know, Alan Wynne Jones is coming towards the end. He's been a stalwart for. I mean, you know, he's going to go down as one of the best players ever. In history, yeah, he's two, he's two caps off the the most capped international ever. Like what a, what an achievement that is! If you have a think about that for a second, like you know, in the second row as well. Yeah, yeah. Mate, let's just lastly just talk about the the makeup of the Pro 14. I know you're uh, going to coaching now with Ospreys, which is brilliant. I know it's something that you, you want to do as well. But there's a lot of talk around the Pro 14. I commentate on it obviously a big fan of the two Scottish teams and it's great that it's got back up and running and it's, it's going to be back up and running without the South African teams. You know, there's a lot of talk of the other South African franchises coming into it. Um, you know, there's talk of a, a potential all Britain league. You know, there was talk of the MLR. I mean, from a player who's played in it and who can now probably have a bit of an opinion on it, what would you like to see happen? Because for me, the conference A, conference B, you know, the way things work with that and obviously there's games then played that are crossovered around Christmas, the Derby games. It's quite difficult to consume, right? Um, yeah. Would there be a dream scenario for you to see how that would unfold in Pro 14? I don't know. I think, what, however structured, I think what you need is, you know, the, the best players playing for the clubs as much as possible. And I think when I first started playing for the Ospreys, when the crowds turned up when the Ospreys were playing against Leinsters when they had the Darcy's or Driscoll's. You know, these big internationals play, and I think at the moment, you know, far too often you're seeing the international boys not playing for their regions, and obviously I know there's no crowds in the stadiums at the moment, but, you know, you, you want the supporters to look at the team sheet and, and see these big internationals they've seen doing the Six Nations, doing the Autumn Internationals, come into your local club grounds and, and playing. And I think that's going to bring the fans into the stadium and that revenue which, which rugby needs. And whichever way the, the, the Pro 14 is structured, I think, you know, most people would want to see those big players playing week in, week out to their region. Or, I know they can't play week in, week out, but, you know, more than probably what they are now. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I agree with you. I mean, I think when you look at, you know, Leinster play Munster and they're fully loaded, the level of the, the games, you know, Ospreys play Scarlets or, or whatever, Edinburgh play Glasgow, it's fully loaded. It's a completely different product. Um, like, how difficult is it? I mean, you're going to be in this position now when you're 
talking with the superstar players and then there's an international window and who knows let, you know let's just pretend everything gets back to normal like you know h- how do you manage that I mean you, you've been a player who obviously wants to play international you want to be at, at your freshest and you know that if you play the week before and you've played three games before that you ain't going to be at your best for the game so how as a club do they manage that? Yeah, I think I think it's, it's dictated by by the union as well, isn't it? You know, they're going to say so. Take Alan Wynn, for example. You know, they're going to want him for for Wales as much as possible. And obviously, he's probably a little bit of an exception because you know he's, he's obviously an older athlete and he needs to be looked after a bit more. But you know, it's almost a bit of tug of war. You know, Wales want their their best players to play. You know, Six Nations, the autumn, and and the club want the internationals as much as possible. And speaking from an off space point of view, I think you know. We have we're not blessed with a ridiculous amount of players like like Leinster. So, you know, when we lose sort of four or five top internationals, you know, you know it's a bit of a difference. And then you've got you know a lot of the young boys coming through, which which is great for the young boys getting the, the opportunity. But you know, need that experience there to to guide them along. Okay, brilliant, buddy. Um, it leads me to say good luck with retirement. It sounds weird saying that, but you are in retirement from your first career. But more importantly. With the book, mate. Um, I hope it goes really well. Hopefully, you get a lot of traction. You deserve it. It's brilliant. And um, yeah, hopefully, in South Africa, if you're there, we can enjoy a beer. Um, a Lions legend and a Barbar's legend together. <laughs> 100%. Hey, top man, Jim. Thanks, mate. Cheers, hooky. <laughs>